Jay's Two Cents here, and we're gonna talk about computer parts today and how not to overspend. Now sure, there are like seven or eight main components when it comes to building a computer, but we're gonna focus on the main four, that being CPU, motherboard, graphics card, and memory, because those easily make up the most expensive parts in your system, as well as the easiest areas to overspend and get really nothing back for that money. We're gonna go ahead and start with CPUs. Uh, there's two main players, obviously. There's only two players when it comes to building a, per a personal computer, that is AMD and Intel. Uh, it's one of those things where it's becoming very hard to recommend Intel these days, only because they've not been very innovative, they've not really pushed the boundaries, they've not really changed anything. In fact, they're on the same 14 nanometer process they've been on for years now, years and years. Whereas AMD, on the other hand, has been very innovative in pushing the amount of cores that you can get uh, in, in the same package, running the same motherboards. Um, their IPC is significantly better than Intel, although their core clocks are a little bit behind. Um, it's easy to get caught up though in core count and thinking core count is king when it comes to building a computer. Now, we're gonna go on the assumption here, here that people building a computer right now watching this video are looking at building a gaming computer. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that because I've said over and over, computers that are built to handle the latest games can handle pretty much any sort of productivity task that you would throw at it in your home. I mean, sure, there are corporate uses and there are very outlier types of use cases where you're gonna need a you know, the best floating point precision performance and all that sort of stuff. But that is not what most people building, watching this video are gonna be doing. So we're going on the assumption you're building a gaming computer. Now keep in mind that although games are now leveraging more cores than they ever have in the past, they're still not going to leverage high core count CPUs to their fullest potential. In fact, we've seen some high-end CPUs actually perform worse than the lower end CPUs just simply because of the core count and the way that they're utilized with CCXs and such on AMD's platform. So it's one of those things where a person might be interested in Intel because of this, the, the sheer strength of its compatibility with pretty much all software and all games. But if you're the kind of person that wants your computer to have a little bit of forward-facing compatibility, and notice I use forward-facing compatibility and not the term future-proofing, because there's no such thing as future-proofing when it comes to computers, you might be highly interested in going AMD because of the fact that as games and programs use more cores, you get more core per dollar on AMD than you do with Intel. Now, what CPU is right for you is gonna depend, again, on what you wanna do with your CPU. We find that the 5600X is a really, really good sweet spot in not overspending for your CPU and also getting a high enough core count to where you can do multitasking, live streaming, have games still be able to utilize them, get a high enough core clock, to feel like you've got a really high-end system without spending crazy high-end money. It's not that long ago where to get the amount of cores that you could on a 5600X, and this is actually a 5800X, by the way, if you're noticing the seven, you would have to spend $1,000 about five years ago to get the same amount of performance and core clock and core count as you do on a 5600X today in 2020. Now this is all hypothetical, assuming you can get your hands on it because of the popularity of computers right now and stay-at-home orders and people building home offices and gaming computers and such, that, um, we're assuming you can get your hands on it, but things are gonna normalize. You will be able to get your hands on them in the future. Intel though is becoming harder and harder to recommend these days, just simply because of the reasons I stated at the start of, the start of this segment. They do not, they have not been innovating at all. And they're still kind of holding on to their core base, which is like, I like to overclock. And you know what? Most people are not doing that on their, their daily computers. They're just not pushing the boundaries like we do for fun around here. Um, but, when it comes to both of these uh, CPUs, you've got to plug them into something, and that is motherboards. And this is where it is extremely easy to throw away money unnecessarily. Now obviously the board that you choose is gonna depend on the CPU that you chose. So you need to make sure that the socket type is correct, obviously. Now this isn't a, a how-to guide on how to match all that up. We're gonna assume you know that if you're running an X570 motherboard, you have to use an X570 compatible CPU and vice versa. When it comes to Intel, however, the chipset is gonna determine which CPU you can put in there because there's not really any backwards compatibility when it comes to, to Intel. But there are different tiers of motherboard that make it very easy to overspend. This is an extreme Rampage board. I only have this here because it's like a $700 or $800 motherboard. This is a, because of Intel's X299 Extreme platform. This right here uh, doesn't really offer you a whole lot more than some of the lower, like let's say Strix motherboard. Yes, this is an X470, but they do make Strix for Intel and AMD, vice versa. They are sort of cross compatible when it comes to the tier structure of how the naming scheme works. But this is simply uh, a, an easy way to overspend. There's very little things 
very few things that a $700 motherboard, we just push that out of the way, a $700 motherboard can do that a $150 motherboard can't. Usually the difference here is gonna be in the build quality. It's gonna be how many layers is the PCB? How many, what's the gold content in the socket? How many USBs uh, does it have? How many USB-Cs and or Thunderbolt if you're on Intel? We find that more often than not, a, it, let's talk about Ryzen here for a second. More often than not, running the 50 series motherboard is much more beneficial to the cost of your system than running a 70 series motherboard. So the X470 motherboard, if you're gonna pair it with a 5000 series CPU, really the only thing you're giving up uh, is the PCIe Gen 4 capabilities. And if you're not running a PCIe Gen 4 storage device, GPUs aside, because they are still not utilizing all of PCIe Gen 3 16X, let alone needing PCIe Gen 4, uh, you could save some money by going with the X470 motherboard, making sure it has the latest BIOS, running a 5000 series CPU, and get yourself a really good deal because they do like to have blowouts because they are uh, compatible with the latest CPUs. They're still making them and you can still find them on shelves. Now, there's other things you'll find motherboards having tough armor, whether they've got the plastic covers on the back, plastic covers on the front, how many M.2 storage uh, devices are able to be plugged into it. And these are areas where it's very easy to overspend because you're not changing anything in terms of the quality of the motherboard itself by how many of those devices it has. You can find that if you find yourself a lower tiered motherboard, whether it be a Strix versus a, a Crosshair, uh, for example, the, what tends to make these motherboards different in their pricing is the build quality in terms of their VRMs, how many chokes and capacitors that it has, what's the phase of the VRM, and these are things that are really going to only matter to people who are trying to overclock their CPUs. Overclocking the CPU, adding more voltage, adds more heat, it adds more load to the VRMs. Things that, if I'm saying this and you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, clearly don't pertain to you. Now that's not to say you can't play around with some overclocking on like a Strix motherboard or a lower tiered motherboard. Usually these motherboards are gonna have safeguards built in so that you don't overextend or overexert the power deliveries on these motherboards, but that's not to say that you couldn't. But if you wanted to play around with adding a couple hundred megahertz here and there, or even going into Ryzen Master and doing a little bit of overclocking there, you can pretty much do that with just about any of the motherboards that are on the market now for AMD CPUs because they are all unlocked, unlike Intel, where if you don't go with a K-SKU CPU or a KF-SKU CPU, or F also, which just means no IGP built in, then uh, you're not gonna be able to overclock it because the CPU itself is gonna be locked. Whereas AMD still offers the value of having every CPU be unlocked. The only thing limiting how far you can go with it really is the silicon lottery and the motherboard itself. But I would not recommend spending $500 on a motherboard to plop a $300 CPU in there. That's a complete waste of money. There's no, there's no return on that investment and it's nothing but diminished results. You're gonna get extra features you probably are not gonna care about. So I find that usually spending anywhere between the price of the CPU or less seems to be about the right pairing. $150 motherboard or so, look at the reviews, see what the overall uh, like Newegg response has been, Amazon, and then kind of make your best decision there. But although the motherboard is responsible for everything being plugged into it, it's one of the easiest areas to overspend. Another area that's easy to overspend is your memory. There's this old adage, computer's running slow. I think I need more memory. And that goes back to when I was a kid. In fact, I think back when I was a kid and we were talking about like 286s, Commodore 64s and such, RAM was something that held you back. But that's not the case today. And you see more and more of these kits of like 32 gigabytes of Dominator Platinums or 32 gigs of you know, Vengeance Pros. 4,000 megahertz, 4,400 megahertz, or 5,100 megahertz like we see with some of our crucial stuff that we have around here. These are areas that are going to just suck up your budget and really give you no tangible return. We've done videos in the past where we've talked about what's the sweet spot of RAM speed for gaming and, and on both Intel and AMD. And we found that right around 3,000 megahertz is where we scale performance up. So between 2133, which is what these RAMs, these RAMs, these RAM sticks, these DIMMs will boot at out of the box without enabling the XMP or DOCP, which is their extreme profiles for Intel and AMD, they will give you more performance and more FPS up until about 3000 RPM, 3000 RPM, wow, <laughs> car stuff, up to about 3000 megahertz. And then beyond that, it just, it stops scaling. 
So people might go, well then why the heck do they even sell these 4,000 megahertz and 5,000 megahertz dims? Well, extreme overclocking. You start pushing the CPU hard enough, the, the memory has to keep up with it, and it really makes no difference to the average consumer out there. The other thing is the capacity. No one out there building a gaming rig needs 32 gigabytes of memory. Someone out there right now just got triggered by me saying that. But the reality is 16 gigabytes is still the sweet spot. And you're gonna notice it tends to go 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, because obviously multiples of eight, there's always gonna be multiples of eight times two because dual channel, which is why you're gonna basically see them scale in that sort of mathematical order. 16 gigabytes of DDR3000 from any reputable brand, whether it be Corsair, G-Skill, Crucial, Patriot, uh, these, uh, what, um, what's the other one that's out there? The Team Group is now a brand that's really sort of made a good name for themselves. 16 gigabytes, 3000 megahertz, dual channel if you're running a dual channel CPU or if you're running quad channel like Threadripper or Extreme Intel, make sure you have at least one DIMM per channel so you need four sticks, is going to be plenty. Now the other side of that discussion is gonna be single bank versus dual bank. And I'm gonna tell you right now, for the most part, it doesn't matter. In fact, if you took a gaming PC, if we built one that was with single bank RAM and dual bank RAM, and no, that's not single channel and dual channel. They're not the same. We've not done a video on this because I don't really want to cause more confusion for people. If you want to know what your, what your system's running, you could download CPU-Z, go to the memory tab. There's another tab, or to the right of the memory tab, there's one more, I can't remember what it's called. It'll tell you what bank your RAM is running in. If we did a blind taste test with a single bank and a dual bank system next to each other, identical for every other part, you would not be able to tell the difference only if you do, did benchmarking and you find the two or three FPS extra that you might find on a, on a uh, single bank versus dual bank RAM. This is an area that's easy to overspend. Extra lights and things on here are all ways to increase the cost of RAM without changing the performance. So our recommendation there, honestly, 16 gigabytes, 3000 megahertz, dual channel, call it a day. If you listen to our advice, that leaves you more money for the fun part of your system, and that being the graphics card. Gaming PCs, their, their performance is 90% dictated by your graphics card. If it's a CPU-bound title that's got big open-world sandbox, then yes, your CPU can matter, but your graphics card is still responsible for more than 90% of your gaming performance. And saving money in these areas will allow you to get the biggest, baddest graphics card that you can afford. Now this is the only time you're gonna hear me recommend get the highest tiered product that you can afford in this category. The only thing that's gonna truly hold back the potential of, your, of how high you can go is your power supply. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that the power supply that you pair with your graphics card at least, at least meets the rating recommended by the graphics card, whether it be 750 watt for a, third, a lot of 30 series cards, 550 watt for like a 2080 Ti or whatever, and make sure that it's from a reputable power supply brand, you're not gonna have any problem delivering power to it. Now keep in mind those ratings are usually very overestimated because they wanna make sure that you have overhead and, and available power uh, above what the system needs. So a 550 watt rated, power supply for a, uh, a 550 watt recommended graphics card is actually more than you need, which is a good thing. The only other thing that's gonna dictate uh, your, your graphics card here, honestly, is your CPU. As long as you're not spending the least amount of money that you can spend on a CPU and trying to pair it with a high-end GPU, you don't really have to worry about bottlenecking. Especially with Ryzen CPUs and the latest Intels, their core clocks are high enough, their IPCs are high enough to where it is actually pretty hard to bottleneck a GPU these days. We've done some videos testing that. You've really, really got to go bottom, bottom dollar to start bottlenecking your GPUs these days. The other area too that you can easily overspend in graphics card is the tier of the graphics card. You've got your reference edition cards, which are the ones that are just based off the basic design from AMD and Nvidia. And then you've got your custom cards, like our Strix Special Edition White 2080 Ti right here, which probably costs $150 more than a reference 2080 Ti. This is not gonna necessarily get you much more performance. Very little performance, actually. The base clocks out of these and the boost clocks that come with these Special Edition cards are usually anywhere between 20 to 50 megahertz higher than a reference. The difference is these cards are based and built to overclock. And if you don't plan on overclocking them, that's an extra area that you can waste money. Um, we find still that in terms of the best value of graphics card, for in our opinion, from AMD's current offering is the 6800 non-XT, because we do know that we're gonna have new 
RDNA 2 mid-range cards. That's why we're not recommending 5700 XT. That's older architecture at this point or even something like a 2060 Super or a 2070 Super from last gen, if you can get your hands on it. Obviously, graphics cards right now are a commodity, extremely hard to find, out of stock, across the board from all generations that are available. Again, because of the popularity of people building computers right now because of stay at home, self-entertainment, games and such, um, we find that, we're, again, we're speaking hypothetical here, if you can get your hands on them. But if you've done everything right and you saved money in other areas of your build, then it leaves you more money for the fun stuff that truly does have an impact of what your overall experience is gonna be with your computer. Now, of course, there's other things that can impact, you know, your case, your power supply, your cooler, and all that sort of stuff. But we find that these areas right here are the easiest places to save money and spend money properly without having to worry about getting terrible diminishing returns. If you think we've missed something, or you think there's something very important that we didn't say that we should have that you think could help somebody down in the comments below, then put your best suggestion on saving money on building or upgrading a new computer down in the comments, and then maybe we'll go through and heart and pin the best ones. That way we can make sure people see it. Guys, if you're building a new computer here, have fun. Don't be afraid of it. I know a lot of people are afraid of, of wasting and spending money. If you've never built a gaming computer before, saying you're gonna probably get hooked in a, in a new hobby is, goes without saying, and, it, and it's probably extremely understated. Um, but enjoy it. If you're building it, make sure you share with us on social media, at Twitter, or at Twitter, at Jay's Two Cents at Twitter. Show us your builds. And as always, guys, we'll see you in the next one. And speaking of builds, we're probably gonna start judging years here real soon. So get your pictures ready.